happening today. We're very excited that you're here. This is a little different what we're doing today. Um, and what we're going to do first is we're going to go around the room and we're going to introduce ourselves. So I'm going to start with Council Member Ritchie. Hey, I'm uh, Richie Floyd. I am District 8 Council Member in St. Petersburg, and I'm on the Ford Pinellas Board. I'm Al Johnson. I'm the Mayor of St. Pete Beach, and uh, I am not on the Pinellas Board. Yet you will be. You will be soon. <laughs> okay. cool. Thank you. Uh, Coast of Atticos, Mayor of Tarpon Springs. I'm looking forward to the workshop. Thank you for having Thank us. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah. Uh, Brian Scott, Pinellas County Commission, and I was just appointed to this board last night, so glad to be here. <laughs> uh, Dave Eggers, Pinellas County Commission, and I'm on the uh, Four Pinellas board, and it's a welcome everybody. I'm glad to see such a great turnout. Julie Ward Bajalski, Mayor of the Great City of Dunedin, um, and member of the Four Pinellas board. Good afternoon, everyone. Gina Driscoll, St. Petersburg City Council. I um, am actually on the Ford Pinellas board, holding the PSTA seat on the board, and I'm the incoming chair of PSTA for the, for the coming year. Good morning, or afternoon, everybody. Michael Smith, uh, Commissioner, City of Largo, and a uh, member of the board and incoming vice chair for next year. Bonnie Noble, Kennesaw City Council member, and I represent the inland communities. Kathleen Beckman, Clearwater City Council and current vice mayor of Clearwater. Frank Hibbard, Mayor of the City of Clearwater, former Chair of the MPO back when we called it that, and Vice Chair of uh, T. Barta when we first started. I'm Denise Hausberg. I'm a commissioner in Indian Rocks Beach and currently serving as Vice Mayor, and I'm up for re-election next year. <laughs> <laughs> Joe McCall, Commissioner, Indian Rocks Beach. Jude Bond, uh, Commissioner, Indian Rock Speech. Chris Burke, City of Seminole City Council, newest member of Ford Pinellas. I'm uh, Mayor Woody Brown, the City of Largo. I'm here as a guest. David Will, Mayor of the Town of Reddington Beach. Hello, everyone. I'm Dave Gaddis, uh, Mayor of Bel Air Beach. Good afternoon. Dave Albritton, Clearwater City Council and uh, Treasurer of Ford Pinellas. Tom Shelley, Commissioner from Beautiful Bel Air and past board member for Forward Pinellas. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Whit Blanton. I'm the Executive Director. And I'd like to go out in the audience. Marty, would you tell us who you are? Well, good afternoon, Marty Steve. I was on Congress and the Restoration Group and worked on a lot of the city side here. My wife, Marty Scott, and the rest of the Kelly as well. We are the Town Engineers. Ryan, you want to introduce yourself? Okay. Did we miss any anybody over there? Over there. Okay. Is that it? Doesn't work without a mic. I think we got everybody. No, there's somebody else back. One more. Okay. Okay. So in 2011, I was appointed to the Pinellas Planning Council slash the Metropolitan Planning Organization to represent all the beach communities. 
There are 13 elected officials who serve on these agencies, and we quickly at that time began a merger of the two organizations, and today we have Ford Pinellas. I quickly learned the importance of Ford Pinellas and the tasks we are responsible for, for concerning infrastructure, safer streets, planning in communities, mixed use, housing, small business, mobility for all, and more. We were required to understand much more than the cities we represent. All the communities and the county were topics of concern. It occurred to me when I became the chairperson this year, it would be an interesting idea to gather elected officials and other stakeholders together, even if just for a moment, and share our hopes and our vision, what each of our dreams are collectively for the future of Pinellas County. Recently, I did a class assignment in front of the county commission during their budget cycle. And I have a few fun facts that you might not know that I'd like to share with you. Pinellas County maintains 147 bridges each year. Last year, 77 miles of roadway were, were resurfaced. 27,000 feet of sidewalk were repaved. And 10 billion gallons of wastewater were treated. 7 billion gallons of reclaimed water was produced. So that's a lot. And I'm sure that not everyone in here knew all those things. Maybe David Edgars, I'm not sure. <laughs> and Barry Burton, of course, yes. And at the same time, we have areas where we do not have clean water. The good news is our county commission with the county administrator put a plan into place to address the clean water issues this year. Which brings us to today. We will hear the perspectives from three of our mayors and a message from FDOT Secretary Gwen. And the hope is this day will give each of us pause to reflect, to investigate tomorrow, and collectively dare to imagine our vision for Pinellas County. So thank you for being here. And with that, I'm gonna introduce you again, and I'll let Whit take it over. Okay. Well, thank you, Mayor, and it's been great having you on the board for, for all these years. It's gonna be really strange not having you here because you've been here the whole time I've been I, here. I hold the Guinness Book of World Records. I just, <laughs> I don't know how that happened, but it did happen. Yeah. <laughs> so let me uh, set the stage for our discussion today. And first of all, this is a workshop and we're not taking any actions. We're not taking any votes, but we are gonna be taking some notes. And Today, you're gonna to be guiding us on a couple of things that are important. So if we could get the PowerPoint uh, put up here, I think we're gonna launch into just a very brief bit of uh, context setting to set the stage for your discussion, and then we're gonna turn it over to the, to the mayors uh, to articulate their vision a little bit. Um, and we wanted to make sure that we had some new voices, uh, and this wasn't just an insular board discussion because we talk every month. And we always have a good discussion, but I think this is an opportunity at the end of the year to step back and think a little bit about uh, our role and the future of Pinellas County. Next slide, please. So our, our job here, and we can just advance uh, through these, is to be a convener and a facilitator for dialogue and a keeper of the vision uh, here in Pinellas County. Uh, and that's important because we are a countywide planning agency and we serve all 25 local governments equally. And we know that the city of St. Petersburg and Pinellas County have the largest populations, but we have to pay attention to uh, the Bel Airs and the Reddingtons and everybody. And we provide an avenue and a forum for that dialogue. And then we take those shared perspectives, those different opinions, and we try to make sense out of that. And then we try to set uh, priorities for consideration by the Florida Department of Transportation, by PSTA, by our regional partners in the other counties, so that we have a clear vision of ourselves and what we want to achieve and how we can do that collectively. And there's no substitute for really strong partnerships. Uh, we, can't, we can't do anything without working together. And here at Ford Pinellas, we don't operate anything, we don't maintain anything, and we certainly don't build anything but we provide the conduit for the uh, state and federal funds to make that happen. 
And more importantly, I think, we provide the platform for partnerships internal to our county to have consensus to advocate for things and to set priorities in, uh, within our jurisdictions. So today we're gonna share some perspectives on our countywide future and countywide goals. And this is an important backdrop to set the stage for our 2050 Advantage Pinellas Long Range Transportation Plan. And you know, 2050 is a really long time away. I was thinking just 20 years from now, I'll be 78 years old. I hope I'm still around. Uh, so it's hard to imagine what 2050 will look like. But we, ha we owe it to ourselves to plan for people who are not even born yet, people who haven't even moved here yet, uh, people who might be six, seven, eight, 10, 15 years old today who are gonna be the leaders of tomorrow. What, do we, what kind of a county do we wanna leave them with? What kind of a region do we wanna leave them with? Uh, we here at Ford Pinellas have already adopted the 2045 Advantage Pinellas Plan and that was done in partnership <coughs> with Pinellas County and with PSTA, we all collectively have looked at that brand identity and said, you know, there's a lot of advantages for being in Pinellas County. How do we strengthen those advantages? And a big part of those advantages are the fact that we have 25 local governments who all have a unique sense of identity, a sense of place, and, and, and values and objectives that they want to achieve. So we've got to reinforce that shared platform to look at land use and housing, and I'm a big believer that housing is infrastructure, uh, that housing is transportation policy, and, and vice versa. And so this is really an opportunity for us when we think about the 2050 plan to set our vision uh, for the future and figure out how we can advance those defined priorities. The last point I want to make about today's workshop and how it'll help us is that in 2017, we adopted a strategic business plan for this organization. And after about five years, it's gotten a little stale and it's time to revisit that business plan. It's not like nothing has happened in five years. We've had some big changes in how we work, uh, in how we commute, uh, in where we live, in where we can afford to live. And so it's time for us to revisit that business plan. And our organization has changed a lot since 2017. We've had a lot of retirements. We've brought on a lot of new staff. We have a very young staff in a lot of ways. But I am so proud that compared to where we were in 2015 when I was hired, we have an extremely cohesive, very talented, very capable staff that I'm very proud of. And I haven't seen a better staff around uh, in my career. So I'm, I'm very pleased with that. And we wanna make sure we retain those staff and we grow as an organization as well. So your comments today as we take notes and listen will help inform our strategic business plan that we intend to bring back to the board for approval sometime in the spring. So I'm gonna turn it over to my staff, Chelsea Favreau and Rodney Chapman, to just set a little bit of shared dialogue, and then we'll introduce the mayors in a moment after that. Um, but we wanna get everybody on the same page because we know a lot of folks sitting around this table and in this room haven't been coming to the Ford Pinellas meetings, and I bet you haven't been watching them on TV regularly either. <laughs> so we wanna get you all up to speed on what we've been up to and what our staff thinks is coming in 2023. So I'll turn it over to Chelsea first. Good afternoon, everyone. Chelsea Favero, Ford Pinellas staff. Thank you for that introduction, Wit. So Rodney and I, we're going to talk a little bit about some of our recent successes uh, for each of these topics that are up here on the screen, and also where we foresee us moving forward in each of those areas in the coming uh, two to three years. So in regards to transportation system needs and priorities, one of uh, our biggest recent successes is the Sunrunner Bus Rapid Transit. And yes, while this is a PSTA project, uh, we are very, very grateful for the collective advocacy from uh, our partners throughout the region and helping to move this project forward. Um, and it's been operational now for a couple of months. Um, and we're very, very pleased uh, with the data that we see coming out of PSTA in regards to ridership and how the service is functioning. Uh, other recent achievements uh, in regards to US 19, uh, the Curlew Interchange and pedestrian crossings. The Curlew Interchange uh, portion of the roadway will be under construction within the next six months. That will also include pedestrian crossings every quarter to half a mile. And the Florida Department of Transportation has agreed to incorporate bike ped crossings along all future segments of US 19 uh, going forward. So because of our strong partnership with the department, uh, we're very, very happy uh, with that result. The Harn Boulevard pedestrian bridge was just placed about two weeks ago. 
uh, across US-19. And then down in South St. Petersburg, the 34th Street South Corridor is being resurfaced and also being turned into what's being called the Complete Street Project. We're going to be widening out the sidewalks with the department, uh, in installing mid-block crossings, and also uh, looking at business access or bus access transit lanes, uh, bat lanes, uh, where uh, the bus will have priority uh, moving along the corridor and then vehicles will be able to utilize that space for turning. In regards to our active transportation projects, uh, we've been very successful in this regard. Uh, up until Whit Blanton started here about 2016, 2017, our, our agency was only prioritizing large roadway projects for, uh, for state and federal construction funding. Uh, however, we've revamped that process and we're now directing uh, as much of our flexible funding as we can to non-road projects, and that includes our active transportation projects. Um, within the next year, the department is going to be upgrading the crossing of the Duke Energy Trail at State Road 60 near the Home Depot and Old Coachman Road. And then the 18th Avenue South Corridor, we've been working very closely with the city of St. Petersburg in developing uh, an active transportation corridor along that roadway. And then flexible funds, as I had mentioned, are going towards multimodal pro projects. We're, I think, the only MPO in the state of Florida that is dedicating 100% of our flexible funds towards multimodal projects that support redevelopment. Because of our close linkage with the countywide land use plan, we're able to accept applications for funding from our local government partners that really demonstrate the linkage between the transportation investment and the surrounding community. So we've been very successful with that. Uh, we have about six Complete Streets projects uh, in, our, in the FDOT work program right now, uh, and we plan to continue the program moving forward. And also our Advantage Alt-19 Investment Corridor pro Plan, that plan has been underway now for a few months, looking at how we can prepare that corridor for future transit investment and what needs to be done to improve mobility while also supporting redevelopment strategies along that corridor through the Seminole and Largo communities and up into Clearwater. Moving forward, what we'd like to do is we'd like to take another look at our active transportation plan. While we've been very successful in advancing priorities from it, priorities change over time and we want to make sure that now that we've gotten through the first few projects on, the, uh, on our active transportation list, the next ones that are coming up are still supported by the local governments. They still make sense given new trail investments and best practices. Uh, so we do plan to retouch on that in the coming uh, months and year. Also, the US-19 Regional Express Transit, T-BARDA, was looking at this service in the northern uh, part of US-19 up into Pasco County. Um, this is not a bus rapid transit project, but more of an express transit project. And we'd like to kind of pick up where T-BARDA has, has brought the project to thus far and continue to work with the department and Pasco County on seeing how we can advance that regional express transit project across our county lines. Also moving forward with the Advantage Alt-19 corridor, as that study progresses, we'd like to be able to start implementing the recommendations that come out of that study in order to prepare the corridor for future transit investment. And then when it comes to transit funding, this is probably one of our biggest challenges uh, because state and federal participation in transit projects is heavily dependent upon local funding participation. So we're going to be working very closely with our local and state partners to make sure that we can identify some transit projects that we can effectively move forward. When it comes to Vision Zero and safety, back in 2021, this agency adopted the Safe Streets Pinellas Action Plan. And part of that, was, or with that came a resolution, basically demonstrating our commitment towards safe streets. We distributed that resolution to all of our local government partners, and to date, we've had 22 out of, out of our 25 local governments sign on to and adopt that ordinance or that resolution. And we're very, very happy with that. However, we still like to get to 25, and we're gonna be working on that going forward. The Safe Streets Pinellas uh, also identified a number of demonstration projects, and these are really projects that uh, looked at certain treatments or technologies that aren't quite mainstream yet, and we tested them out in a few locations around Pinellas County just to see how they worked and if we could utilize them in other locations. Uh, the, the image that you see in the upper right-hand corner, uh, that was a project that we did at Alt-19 and Curlew Road in the Dunedin area. 
and we utilized this near-miss technology to evaluate um, crashes that were kind of almost happening but weren't quite happening so that we could really see what the main conflict points were. We could try to identify improvements uh, to make that area safer uh, for people not just being hit already but also people that, you know, crashes that are almost happening basically. And then in the lower part of the screen, that's a before and after image of uh, First Avenue South in St. Petersburg at 2nd Street. We did a demonstration there with the city where we looked at some temporary uh, pavement markings and also uh, uh, curb extensions to really slow down the vehicles. Where you see that green stripe, that's the Pinellas Trail crossing. And what was, being, what was happening is vehicles were coming down first, taking a right onto that uh, second street, and there were a lot of conflicts with trail riders and pedestrians in that area. So because of this project, we found that uh, the average speed of vehicles turning right there decreased uh, from about 34 miles an hour to about 24 miles an hour, uh, which a 10 mile an hour difference is actually really big if you're a pedestrian and if you have a conflict with a vehicle. So we've had a lot of success with these demonstration projects. And then just moving forward on Vision Zero and safety, we'd like to continue to advance projects uh, that were identified in the Safe Streets program. The image up on the screen there, that is of one of those near-miss cameras. We plan to utilize that technology at more locations. One location that we're gonna be using this on, or one application, is for our complete streets before and after studies. All the projects that we've advanced for uh, funding through the complete streets program, we really wanna be able to document the um, the impact that those, pro those projects are having. Uh, so we're utilizing the near-miss technology to really get a before condition, before the uh, construction, and then we'll be going out about three years post-construction to go ahead and measure and see what the impact of the transportation investment was. We plan to enhance our collaboration with the school district. Uh, we're working on coordinated uh, messaging and outreach with the district, and we've also begun a project to prioritize bus stop improvements uh, with Pinellas County and the district. And then finally, we'd like to strengthen the planning capacity of our agency through the acquisition of new staff. And with that, I'll turn it over to Rodney. So you, you uh, didn't mention the grant application at the federal government, but we partnered with six cities in Pinellas County, or was five. it five? five? Five cities to apply for that, and we should be hearing on that grant application, mm -hmm. what, in about the next three or four weeks, I yes. think. Yes, thank you. Thanks, Chelsea. <laughs> Uh, so for the next few minutes, I want to talk to you about a uh, slightly different uh, set of focus areas for the agency, and um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with some of these headlines that we've placed here on the slide, uh, but we also thought it important to put some of the headlines into the proper context because oftentimes the headlines don't uh, convey the magnitude of the problem. So I just recall when me and my wife bought our house about 16 years ago, uh, we didn't pay $435,000 for it. And if that was the cost of the house, then we would have made a different investment decision, whether it was a single family home, a town home, or an apartment. Uh, the uh, pressures on housing costs are significant and they do have wide ranging impacts. Now, since we are an integrated land use and transportation agency, we also track transportation costs and how they affect household budgets. And uh, the pie chart to the right shows you when you add up those housing costs with the transportation costs, uh, households are, expend, are spending about 57% of that budget on those two. Again, which uh, has a lot of wide-ranging impacts and does negatively impact uh, the, um, the bottom line for households as well as that quality of life for our residents. But moving forward, uh, we will strengthen the Advantage Pinellas framework that Chelsea mentioned earlier. Again, that's a framework we have within the Advantage Pinellas plan where we are directing growth in housing and jobs in major corridors. Uh, you see those three there uh, below that we have prioritized for uh, future action. We think there is a huge opportunity in repurposing some of our underutilized commercial land to, um, to better accommodate the growth that we uh, know is coming. And um, a couple other things that we'll be working on in 2023 is working with our partners at uh, Pinellas County to develop a action plan uh, for us countywide as well as a housing summit in 2023. When it comes to environmental resilience sustainability, we, we have been playing uh, a key role with our partners around the county and around the region. There are some facts up there that I want to share with the group relative to uh, the 
currents of sea level rise, uh, the fact that our residents have acknowledged that this is a concern uh, for them, and the fact that about a quarter of our land area is susceptible to flooding from storm surge from a category one storm. Um, as the base of knowledge is growing uh, around the county, uh, there is a lot of debate about how to best tackle these issues, either defending what you have today or finding more effective ways to live with water or maybe a combination of both. Uh, the graphic to the right shows you some of the adaptation strategies that uh, have been identified as best practices and those are really focused on using natural systems to make our communities more resilient. And then the uh, defend strategies toward the bottom are more infrastructure based and we also think it's always important to show relative uh, cost factors for those types of strategies with the intent to convey that uh, the fix is, uh, the fixes are varied, but they do cost money. And oftentimes, uh, it, it does require a lot of money. Um, as I mentioned earlier about the base of knowledge that's growing, I was able to um, just capture just a brief subset of the uh, either plans or studies that have been completed by ourselves and our local government partners or aligned agencies over the past several years. You may recognize some of those uh, efforts, whether it be in St. Pete, Largo, or Dunedin. Uh, moving forward, we will continue to serve as a technical resource uh, to these various efforts. For example, yesterday we had um, our advisory committee uh, meeting for the Pinellas County Sustainability and Resiliency Action Plan where we reviewed the, the draft document with the county sustainability director. Uh, we also are serving uh, on a, in a technical capacity, excuse me, on the Clearwater Citywide Vulnerability Assessment. And uh, what's interesting about the county's SRAP plan is we spent a lot of time yesterday talking about implementation. And the message from the county's uh, sustainability director was, we can't do this alone. So uh, he was extending an invitation for the project partners to think about ways in which we can advance those action items together. And it was encouraging to hear him say that and then for our agency in particular, uh, there's some federal requirements that require us to further integrate resiliency strategies into our long-range transportation plan update that Whit mentioned earlier. And uh, also wanted to just bring to your attention, we do have a strong partnership with Pinellas County Emergency Management. And one of the things that's been a uh, need for them is to get a better handle on hurricane shelter space because currently there is a deficit in the county for various uh, storm events. And we think there's an opportunity to work with the development community to help them mitigate some of that shelter space uh, deficit. So we will uh, work with uh, emergency management on a countywide impact fee. And then also, uh, as we continue to more effectively plan for growth and redevelopment, we are going to look at analyzing the capacity of our hurricane evacuation routes. Uh, we also have had the pleasure of working on target employment policy for the last year. So we've uh, been updating our target employment industrial land study, a big long name for uh, that work. But um, we've learned a lot. And one of the things that I wanted to share with the group is that uh, what you're looking at here in this chart is basically job growth in the county from 2001 to 2021. So 20 years of job growth. And what we've learned is a lot of things, but one of the things I want to highlight is that job growth is dynamic. It's susceptible to uh, shocks like uh, the Great Recession, but it's also susceptible to uh, stressors uh, like the pandemic. And so you'll see here is about the beginning of the recession and the, dip in the, in the, uh, the job numbers for the county and then uh, a rise in those numbers and then you have the pandemic. And so um, we'll continue to uh, share more of these this data with our board as they uh, will adopt the study uh, at our next board meeting. One of the other things we learned is Pinellas County does have a distinct advantage when it comes to the ratio of jobs to housing units. And what that means is there is basically a housing unit for every job, so a place for everyone to live who works here. Now, if you compare that to Hillsborough County, which is up here, they are more what we call jobs rich. So they have a lot more jobs than they have housing units, which means that people that work there have to have 
um, other places to live, longer commutes. There's other unintended consequences to that. And then if you look at our partners to North and Pasco, they're down here where they're more housing rich, but jobs poor. So when we think about wanting to continue to attract and, and retain uh, jobs, that's a lofty goal and it's an admirable goal, but we also need to be thinking about producing housing as well. Uh, we also uh, supplemented the work with one-on-one um, -on -one interviews with target employers and, and surveys. And again, uh, the bottom line for that conversation was uh, housing and affordability, cost of living. Those were the main challenges when it comes to attracting and retaining uh, employees for these high-wage jobs. And again, moving forward, we'll uh, wrap up the study uh, next month and begin the process of amending the countywide plan consistent with the study's recommendations. And then uh, last, the last bullet point is um, it's pretty relevant because we've seen the legislature pass a couple bills in past sessions that have undermined our ability to maintain a healthy uh, economy here in Pinellas County. And so we want to continue to monitor the legislature to, to at least have a handle on any legislation that would further erode our ability to make sure Pinellas County is viable for high wage employment. Thank you. No, I think Rodney and Chelsea covered that fairly well just to get you up to speed. I do want to mention about the target employment industrial land study. We are changing with that study our policy of a one-size-fits-all approach to preserving all industrial and employment land in the county, thou shalt not touch, and we're giving local governments a lot more flexibility to adapt some of those um, less viable industrial and employment areas to allow for mixed use. And that's going to take a lot of technical assistance and support, but flexibility's got to be the name of the game. We preach flexibility when it comes to funding for transportation, we preach flexibility when it comes to working with our local government partners because everybody's need is different. So we're trying to thread a fairly narrow um, um, line here of giving flexibility but also having consistency. And, um, and that makes my job really very interesting. So I think now it'd be really good to hear from the perspectives of the mayors and then open it up for a discussion. We really just wanted to give you a little bit of context of what we're working on and that scratched a maybe 5% of all we're doing, but it's some of the major items that we're paying attention to. We'll start, Mayor Hibbard, would you like to start? Okay, thank you, Cookie. Um, frankly, I didn't know you were gonna specifically have us speak. I thought you want us kind of here just to be a sounding board. But I think for me, I just jotted down a couple things once I saw my picture. Um, <laughs> I don't know why. I'm going to go down memory lane with everybody because uh, I first got elected in 2002 and was kind of Clearwater's transportation person until I was term limited out in 2012. And then sat out for eight years and came back in 2020. So I served on the MPO, I served on T BARTA uh, at its inception. And you know, when you sit out eight years, I think it gives you some different perspective. First of all, I think there's a challenge of continuity. How many of you have term limits in your cities? So we're one of the few, but obviously, uh, I think that makes a huge difference. Because I went to a meeting over in Tampa uh, about a year and a half ago, and they had I didn't know many of the faces compared to the ones that were around when I was involved with T-BART and whatnot. And it was interesting because everybody was as passionate as they've always been. But they were talking about some things that we had been talking about back in 2004 and 5, like they were brand new ideas. And I don't blame them, uh, but I did see this continuity issue where unless we're passing the baton and keeping focused on what we ultimately want to get done, which is A, our citizens don't care where county or city lines are, they want to get from point A to point B. One of the ways we can improve sustainability is by people not 
all being in cars one person at a time, right? We can make our area more affordable, we can make it more sustainable, and we can increase the quality of life. One of the biggest things that bothered me back with T. Barta is originally Hillsboro, under Mayor Iorio, who's a friend, they wanted to go and have a transit uh, referendum, and they did not want to wait for Pinellas County. Always thought that was a terrible, terrible mistake. Because as I said, nobody cares about Hillsborough or Pinellas or Pasco. They want to get from point A to point B. And that original referendum failed. And then Pinellas decided to go, and we had green light, and that failed. And then Hillsborough's continue to kind of take shots at it. I think it's something that we have to come together with a unified vision, because that is what is going to get referendums passed. And we have to show people what is in it for them. Uh, I also believe that, you know, we have a great planning staff in our city, and we put plans together. Uh, we have our US 19 plan, which is supposed to be uh, mixed use, we want to have job creation, we want to have residential, we want to have uh, transit-oriented development, but we don't have one project yet that the private sector has said, we want to be a part of that. Instead, we have big box stores like Rooms to Go sucking up properties that really ought to be mixed-use, transit-oriented, and that is a lost opportunity now that's going to be gone for the next 20 years, probably, because they've made a big investment. And one of the things as elected officials, I think we need to keep our eye on the ball. If a plan is not working and the private sector is not adapting to what we're hoping to get accomplished, we better re-examine the plan. Um, I think one of the things we also need to continue to focus on is the partnerships. Forward Pinellas does a great job. We have a great leader in our FDOT secretary and appreciate him being here. I think the CSX line for Pinellas County is still an enormous opportunity. It's the reason we bought the Tampa Bay Times property back in 05, 06, because the Pinellas Trail was there, the CSX line was there, and we hoped that someday we would have a multimodal station, which is finally, you know, gonna come to fruition, and it's been on the drawing board for over 20 years. So nothing moves fast, and that's why I think some of the continuity is critically important for us to keep our eye on the ball. And I appreciate all of you, you know, expending time and your efforts to make this happen, but uh, we need to pick um, a BHAG, a big, hairy, audacious goal uh, for our county and make that a focus to get done and make certain that we're all unified in doing it. Thank you, Mayor Hibbard. I'm gonna ask Mayor Johnson next. Let me figure out how to work this thing, but. Uh... I, um, I think I want to start with, uh, the, we're a little unique, we're the end of the line, so um, transportation for us is more to and from than it is a through. Um, and uh, the, uh, I know it's <laughs> been said that the, uh, the thing that we've uh, come to realize is that uh, bus rapid transit is doing us a big favor because it's a much more efficient way of getting to and from our island than it is, it was with the trolleys. And we've had the trolleys for, since time immemorial. Um, I, and that's one of the things I think makes us a little unique among this, this group here. And, and since I'm the incoming representative for the Barrier Islands Council, and I'm glad to see a couple of my compatriots here from the, from the council, um, I'm a little unique amongst them too, because I am the end. They need something to come through the city and not doesn't necessarily to stop there. Uh, the, uh, the other part of that is um, I've served for the last four years plus on the Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Committee, 
And uh, as both a pedestrian and a cyclist, I find it extremely hard to get off of the barrier islands and into the mainland and get to the trail, which is the only safe place to go north and south on a bicycle. Um, we need to fix that. You know, we can come over Central Avenue ca Causeway is fine. The Bayway is fine. Uh, I will not go anywhere close to the Tom Stewart Causeway. Um, Bel Air, that bridge is fine too. But we, we've got to increase the availability of that because uh, I think it will drastically increase the, uh, the usage of the trail, not that it's not being used extensively now, but it certainly is. Um, the other thing I'm finding is that uh, we've got a bunch of... Uh, really large, large component of, of workers. You know, we've got a ton of jobs on there. Just the trade winds alone has 1,200 jobs. So getting those people and their low wage jobs for the most part, getting them some place that's reasonably affordable to live is impossible on our island. We need a way for them to get to and from the island to work. And uh, I am starting to see a bunch of people utilizing the... Uh, the Sunrunner to do that, which is great. Uh, they're for some reason they never seem to use the uh, the trolley. Um, I know that uh, the past uh, ownership of the trade winds, you know, 11, 1,200 jobs, and the president told me that he offers a free bus pass, annual bus pass, to anybody who wants to take the trolley to and from work. And uh, the last time he told me what the number was, it was like 42 people took him, took advantage of it. So it's very low usage for them working. I don't know how they got to work. I really don't. But I'm, I think I'm finding the Sunrunner is, is becoming a better better thing for that. So that, that's helpful. Um, I think we need to start connecting people up with off-the-island housing that's affordable so they can come to work on the island because we desperately need the people. Uh, I think lastly, um, to me, the big challenge with mass transit is the fact that you've got a last mile, first mile problem. You know, uh, in fact, I found that out when I went and took the Sunrunner downtown to go to the pier <laughs> and uh, Beach Drive. You go down there, and the closest you can get is about seven blocks from there <laughs> with a Sunrunner stop. Yeah, they probably need to look at that, but you know, we'll see. Um, but we, you know, we uh, instituted, uh, instituted our own micro transit operation where we've got uh, a thing called Freebie. It is absolutely free. It's like a free Uber. You put an app on your phone, you call them up, they come pick you up at your house, take you wherever you want to go on the island. So getting to and from your house to the Sunrunner is basically free and it's very affordable. You know, it's easy to find. So I, we're, we're working on our own little thing in our own little kingdom down there, but at the same time, desperately need a good connection to things off the island. And uh, I think uh, we're starting to get there. So uh, uh, that's probably all I can uh, relate to at the time. But thank you very much. Thank you, Alan. Mayor Brown. Thank you, Mayor Kennedy. Um, uh, first, I, I wanted to thank you all for having us here today. Um, I, um, you all know where Largo is. Half of you probably drove through Largo to come here today. Um, we're right in the middle of the county. Uh, we're about 85,000 people. Um, the main one of the main east-west corridors in the county goes right through Largo, One of the, the and US-19 goes right through Largo, as well as some other main north-south. So, so um, Largo's historically been uh, primarily residential, right? So, so we're a bunch of neighborhoods. And, and um, we don't have, um, except for some of our large mobile home parks, we don't have a whole lot of seasonal um, residents. Um, and so our folks really want to preserve their, their, their quality of life that they have, and yet we have a need for more housing, we have a need for more jobs, and, and we have a need for more density. So we've really focused that density increase in our activity centers. So many of you all may know where our activity centers are, the Tri-City Activity Center, which is at the intersection of East Bay and US-19, our Largo Mall Activity Center, and our downtown. Um, so. So that's where you see investments, private investments, some of them mixed use, some of them um, affordable housing projects. Some are 100%, um, uh, either 80 or 120% of uh, AMI um, housing, and some of them are just 30% of a market rate project. So we've, um, we've really focused on those activity centers for 
um, attracting investment in our community and trying to preserve our, our, our historic neighborhoods. Um, so I'm going to talk about a couple of the different points that were brought up before and tell you some of our aspirations as well as some of the things that we've been doing. Um, I, I touched on housing, um, uh, transportation. There's a lot of interesting things going on. There's the West Bay Drive uh, uh, Complete Streets project that is, is coming soon. Um, we've been talking about uh, the alternate US-19. I know that alternate US-19 kind of stops at West Bay Drive going south, uh, but we've been talking a little bit about the pedestrian safety aspects of, of the continuation in front of Mildred Helms Elementary. Um, the county came to us and asked what, what we could do to fix that. And my suggestion was take away two lanes of traffic um, to the north of West Bay Drive. And, and I think it was our commission's suggestion, but to the north of West Bay Drive all the way until that road ends in Tarpon Springs, or past Tarpon Springs, um, it's four lanes. Oh, it's two, I'm sorry, it's two lanes. It's one lane each way. Um, and then for some reason at West Bay Drive, it turns into a five lane road uh, between neighborhoods. And the kids that are walking to Mildred Helms Elementary are walking on a sidewalk that abuts a, tra a traffic lane that people are driving 40 miles an hour. Um, and, and I would, I don't know the, what the numbers are, but a lot of kids walk to that school um, from the surrounding neighborhoods and walk down those roads. So, so um, choking down that road, I think, would, would, be, would do a lot for the community, would do a lot for safety for those kids. And, um, and it would, you know, if we look at it as a complete street, um, it doesn't make sense the way it's built right now. So um, we've installed some mid-block crossings on West Bay Drive. Um, West Bay Drive is a big road that cuts through and we're trying to encourage some downtown redevelopment on West Bay Drive. Um, our new city hall, which is a mixed use city hall, just broke ground a couple weeks ago, uh, right off of West Bay Drive. Uh, we've got another um, 285, I think, is the final number. Apartment complex, it's mixed use coming in our downtown that should break ground in the next four months. Um, we want those folks to be able to walk to work, um, to not have to get in their car. Uh, we've got a major employment center about four <coughs> blocks to the west in the medical arts district uh, where there's Largo Medical, there's the diagnostic clinic, there's two of the top eye centers in the, in the county, probably in Tampa Bay. Um, and, and so there's a lot of people that work over there. Um, until recently, those folks all lived in Feather Sound because many of them are here for a short time um, for you know, two to five years because it's a teaching hospital and they, don't, they wanna live in a nice place. And there wasn't a nice rental place in downtown Largo until about two years ago. So um, 158 Ridge was built and, and we saw an influx of the medical field all living there, both both in the medical arts just district in Largo as well as the Morton Plan area. Um, so so that's, what we're, that's who's gonna be housing or living in those places and, and they're close enough to work that they don't have to clog West Bay Drive going to the west in the morning uh, coming to work. So um, let me see, we're looking at a lot of different intersections as far as safety, uh, both East Bay Drive and Lake Avenue as well as Clearwater Largo and Rosary Road. Uh, there was some mention to Rosary and the connection out to Eagle Lake Park. Um, it's going to be a complete street that's going to get underway in a couple in next year. Um, so that'll take a, a complete trail from the Pinellas County Trail all the way over to Eagle Lake Park along Rosary Road. Um, there's not a whole lot of safe buffered uh, connectivity going east-west in Largo. Um, and, and we're looking for opportunities really to solve that. Another opportunity is, is through Largo Central Park over to the Nature Preserve and then perhaps up Highland Avenue to Eagle Lake Park to connect with the Rosary system. Um, as far as housing, we just spoke yesterday about some of the barriers to affordable housing in Largo. Um, one of them is our parkland dedication fee. It's about seven, seven I'm sorry, it's about $4,070 uh, per residential unit. Um, so that's a big number when somebody's building 200 units or uh, 50 units of affordable housing. Um, so, so we're looking at, we're considering uh, reducing or eliminating that for affordable housing uh, units that are being built in, in Largo. Um, we've done some incentives along those lines in our activity in the West Bay Drive area, our downtown activity center. We're looking at expanding that throughout the whole city. Uh, so we've had some investment. I think um, because of our density, 
bonuses that we've given in the activity centers for affordable housing, and we've seen a lot more investment. My favorite type of affordable housing is one that doesn't look like affordable housing, uh, a, a, an apartment complex that has both market rate housing and affordable units, and we have several of those. If you came from, from uh, the south, you probably drove by some new apartments that have 30% affordable and, and nobody knows who's what, right? And, and it's very, very functional and it works well. Um, as far as uh, environment, environmental and resiliency and sustainability, um, we've been working for a long time on our sustainability action plan. Uh, we've done things like move um, our sanitary sewer uh, lift stations up out of the floodplain. We moved four up in the last two years and we've, uh, we're just applied for a grant to remove four, four, our four remaining that are in a floodplain up out of the floodplain so that they will continue to function when, when the storm surge comes up or we get a bunch of rain or whatever. Um, we spent about $300 million in our sanitary sewer system in the last 10 years. Uh, so in the last five years, we haven't had a single uh, rainwater cause sanitary sewer overflow. We used to have them every day at rain in the summertime, so every single day. So uh, it's a great, great progress. We're looking for opportunities to solve problems, both in transportation and sustainability, uh, as well as, uh, as, well as uh, affordable housing. And we're also looking at everything with that lens um, to make sure that we don't create new problems when we're doing something. So um, lastly, we just bought a, 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 a defunct golf course. Two things on golf courses. We just bought a golf course that had gone out of business that's right next to our medical arts district. So we, we've talked about um, installing a, um, a passive park there that also serves as stormwater um, treatment and stormwater retention. So it's gonna build capacity in the stormwater system, but it's also gonna more naturally treat that water. So as it go, works its way out of, out towards McKay Creek, it's a lot cleaner and, and plants have eaten all the nitrogen out of it along the way. Um, our golf course, we're looking at ways to make that more sustainable. It's likely gonna stay a golf course, but we wanna increase the, the uh, tree canopy there. We wanna look at the chemicals that we're using and make sure that they're staying on site. And if not, uh, make sure that we're using the best possible stuff we can and, uh, and keep it sustainable. It's a, it's a good asset for our residents and our visitors, but, but we wanna make sure that it's managed correctly. And it's making money, which is nice too. So that's kind of on my list. If you guys have any questions, I'm happy to answer anything. I just want to, I see Mayor Dan from Oldsmar came in, so I just want to say a shout out to him. Thank you for coming in. I know you had a previous engagement and Mayor, I mean, and uh, County Commissioner Janet Long is here and I want to say a shout out to her, but before I'm going to let you talk, um, Secretary Gwen, would you like to just get up for a couple minutes from the Florida Department of Transportation and just say a couple words? I want to say about Secretary Sure, would you prefer Gwen, I go up there to the whatever you would like. podium or from over yeah. here? I don't know if people what, can see yeah, me. Yeah, come up here. Come up here. I'll go up there. All How right. about that? I want to just say about Secretary Gwen, when the first time I ever met him, and he is, uh, the whole staff are so approachable and have been so helpful, and they're always trying to find ways to help our communities. They have been working with Mayor Pat um, concerning uh, sidewalks and I, I just they're they're so awesome and I just wanted to say that before you spoke so thank you for all you're doing for our county no thank you and I don't want to yell in your she told me it was really sensitive and I had to talk loud and directly into it I don't want to blow you out here um, I'm really happy to be here today I saw that you were talking about your strategic planning and your vision and so um, you know Witt and his team are always a great partner the the county the cities that we deal with and um, we really want to know what are your goals, what are you looking to achieve, because working with the communities that we go through are a big part of what we do. We are a regional type of a transportation agency. We look at primarily regional travel, but we also know that we're kind of like in neighborhoods as well. We go through communities, we impact them, we want to be a good neighbor. It's kind of like going into homeowners association. We want to make sure our yard looks good and fits in with the community as much as we can. Sometimes that's a challenge but we try to do our best. Um, and the, the other real thing that, um, you know, when I came to DOT about seven years ago, and I knew <laughs> Whit from the private sector for many, many years, both of us were many years in private sector before, and I owned my own business, as did Whit for a long time. 
one of the things that I knew as a business owner was, you know, customer service is probably the hallmark of any good organization. And I found quickly coming to the government that it's true in government as well. If you don't have good customer service, you don't have a good organization. And so we want to be a good, uh, and you are our customers. In fact, everybody in Florida is our customers. And so we want to, to, to know what our customers are thinking and then how can what we do fits in and complements your plans as opposed to either being in conflict or not really taking advantage of the synergies where they exist. And I hear a lot of the talk about transit. I know that's a big topic. We're trying to find that way to get something big in transit. We're continuing to look for opportunities. Um, but uh, we know they're, they're difficult with the local funding that's available. Heard talk about CSX. I heard all of that's still on the table. We just got to figure out if there's a way to actually get to the point where we can do some implementation as opposed to the planning we've done for years. So um, we want to continue to be a good partner uh, to the uh, MPO, to the county, to the cities. Um, I did bring a lot of my staff here with me. And I would just encourage you to continue to work with us. If you see opportunities where we can either be a funding partner, an implementation partner, um, help in on an initiative, let us know, because um, we're all years. And uh, I'm really glad to hear what some of the mayors were saying here today. I, I really appreciated the thought you said, you said about, most people don't care where the county line is, right? You want to get from point A to point B. But I also know that when you're a, a mayor or a county commissioner or something, you do have some concern about those boundaries because that's the people you serve. But we hope to be able to work together with you to also bridge those, get those synergies where we can. So, and I just appreciate being here today. Thank you, Secretary Glenn. I'm gonna turn it over to Janet. We're gonna move into our uh, discussion and opportunities. So I'm gonna let uh, Commissioner Long, you start off with uh, the comments that you have. Thank you very much, Mayor Kennedy, and I do apologize for being a few minutes late. No problem. That said, I want to echo loudly all of the comments made by Mayor Hibbert because like him, I have been involved in some of these issues for a very long time, some of them even longer than you, Mayor, because I remember 50 years ago talking with the Regional Planning Council staff who had just done their very, very first study on regional transportation for Tampa Bay. And for all of those years, we have had incredible leaders, incredible statesmen and politicians who were able to do some very courageous things. And the one thing you left out of all of the things that you heard all the way back then, including the way our citizens feel, they also don't care what party affiliation you are if they can get from point A to point B. I think that's a very key issue of why we're stuck today. And all you have to think about to ensure that that's not a falsehood is to look at Tampa International Airport and think about what if we had to build that airport in today's environment. Do you think we could get it done? And to that point, there is one issue that we tried diligently several years ago to address, and that was the idea of establishing one regional MPO. And Secretary Gwynn, your comments were a great segue into what I wanted to share with everybody today, because I do believe that with everything we've done we have set the foundation to finally begin to move in the direction of one regional MPO. So Secretary Gwynn, would that make your job a little easier if we had a regional MPO? In a lot of ways it could, but I believe all these things have to do. Secretary and Gwynn. That's, but but <laughs> what my question is, if it was Pinellas, Hillsborough, Pasco, would that work? Can you put your mic on, Secretary Gwynn, so we can capture your audio? Sorry about that. And, and first I'll say, we don't formally advocate for regional MPO, but I will say that there's a lot of advantages from our perspective as a regional agency to be able to regionally um, attract funding. We're, we're actually bigger than Orlando region, um, but when you look at the success they've had on things like SunRail and I-4 Ultimate and other things they've done, speaking as one voice, they seem to have a louder 
boys. And we did kind of do that on West Shore. We were able to, as one voice, come in there and we got funding that wasn't even there for us. And so I think it, it could help us. Um, obviously, there's, a, there's so many details to work out about things like how many seats does everybody get and how all that. And you want everybody to kind of want to be part of it for it to work. But I think if we could get one, I think it could be a good thing for our region. Thank you. And so I just have a couple more points I would like to make as it relates to that. When I was very, very instrumental, some of you know this, in obtaining the federal money for the Sunrunner line. And Mayor Johnson and some of his citizens, when we first started, I'm going to tell a little tale on you, Mayor. I hope you don't mind. I've already shared it with you. Yes, it is true. Well, they were some of our biggest opponents. And when we would go into the congressional offices and the senatorial offices in D.C., they'd pull out these uh, dozens of letters that had been written in opposition to funding for the Sunrunner line. And it was just, you know, I finally got to the point after hearing that, after so many visits, I started prefacing my remarks in front of whoever I was sitting with that says, let me tell you about the opponents and what they have talked about in their letters. Now, you know, it takes courage and it takes strength, but I am so proud today to say that that Sunrunner line has enormous ridership, and some of you know it if you've been on it. Uh, it just, it's, it's so easy and it's so fast. And when we first started working on that line, it was the vision to make that the catalyst for what we could have as a spine for the entire region if we could just get out of our own way. And so while Secretary Gwen just told you it would be an opportunity, I can tell you from being in DC so much, the very first questions everyone wants to know, are you here speaking with one voice and one message? And that is absolutely cr critical. And I think Commissioner Eggers will attest that on the TMA leadership group, that has been one place where we have gotten consensus on quite a few things, right, Commissioner? Yeah, um, we had a meeting last week, um, and, and certainly while there was um, some receptivity to the concept, certainly of the of the merged MPOs, uh, we have we have three partners that are sitting in the room from Pinellas County, Hillsborough County, Pasco County. Um, it was at, and and two of the counties were certainly on the same page. When we went a couple years ago, um, we this this MPO said that State Road 60 and I-275 would be the number one priority. We made the motion here in Pinellas County, and all of the communities in the Tampa Bay area got on board with it. It took almost a year. Hillsborough County, surprisingly, was last. Not surprisingly, really. Um, but truly, when you start talking about a regional effort, we all do have to be talking about some of those important transportation um, links, if you will. And, um, and I think it was, a, it was a great conversation this past uh, Friday, but there are, still, there are still voices from across the Bay that just you know, seem to be introspective. By definition, we all are. That's what that's where we get elected, right? I mean, we get elected for our our folks that are here, but there's a regional approach to making it a greater place to be. Um, I'm often reminded of the commercial real estate for women economist that comes every it used to come every year and talked about this region being one of the top economic engines in the country. It could be if the governments and businesses kind of blurred the lines between counties and worked together. Um, you know, probably the business world's way ahead of the government in, in doing that. Um, we're still trying to get a, a real sit-down meeting with our county commission and Hillsborough County Commission, and we've been talking about it for, well, at least for four or five years, seriously, and still haven't done that. I've reached out to try to re-energize that conversation for this coming year. But if you're not doing all of that, then there's a lot of talk and not much advancement. So this MPO discussion will be interesting because we're going to get private sector input, government input, and most importantly, local input. So the voices that we've all had on this MPO have been really important ones that 
in some people's concerns, might get diluted if we do a regional. So there's going to have to be a way that we're maintaining that input from all of the cities in this county when we go to that regional board, whoever goes to that regional board. It'll be a, probably a representation by population to make decisions. So it's, it's not going to be simple and easy, but I think it's the right thing. The funds come as long as we are getting the message, and this is why this kind of meeting is really important, is why we're getting the message from you all what's important. We'll take that message to the regional. Get more money synergistically. You hope you get a lot more money collectively than you would individually. That's the plan. So I think there's hope in, in that, but it's still going to take some time. You have to have three people at the table, three counties at the table. So anyway, excuse me. I want to just add a little bit to the context of, of this discussion, and that is maybe you all don't know, but the Florida Department of Transportation has to compete for money within the state of Florida. And Secretary Gwynn made the point about Miami and Orlando and, and other parts of the state that have been pretty successful getting money because they do speak with one voice. And I want to make sure that Tampa Bay gets its share. And, and, and we haven't gotten our share for a long time, so maybe we need to catch up and get more than our share for a while. But transportation funding is very, very competitive, and not just within the Florida Department of Transportation's revenue streams, but most of the federal funding uh, in the new infrastructure law that passed a year or so ago is competitive funding. We have to apply for that and compete with everybody in the country. So it really helps to have a compelling story to tell and one that reflects the 25 local governments or the region. And so I just want to reiterate that um, we, we get some money by formula, but most of that money comes through discretionary, discretionary grants. And you've really got to demonstrate you're more ready for that money and you've, you're more committed for that money than Orlando or Miami. We're going to open it up. Um, opportunities, if anyone would like to speak on any of these. Any of our, Richie, anything? No. <laughs> I, do, I do want to say one thing. Um, Echo Group is here, and uh, I have to tell you that I don't have a lot of experience with workforce housing because we, we don't have any uh, really in, in Indian Rock Beach or very, very little. And uh, I'm going to say the beach is on the whole. I'm going to throw that out there. But I wanted to learn about it. And we have uh, a group that's here today. And uh, they're, they're from Indian Rock Beach. And I've, I know them. I've got to know their product. I took them to see Mayor Hibbard and sat next to him. And we learned all about what they were doing. And I took them also to see uh, Mayor Brown. And one of the things in their, their idea is unique. You heard Mayor. Mayor Brown talk about uh, affordable housing, workforce housing that doesn't look like that, you know, is a community. And um, they, the, 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 uh, the group that they are putting together right now, the development on the other coast, uh, they have a veteran will be living in there and, or someone who might have uh, a single parent with a child and such. And, we found, I remember Mayor Hibbert and I were talking about it, and that our codes in our communities that um, could do workforce housing, the uh, square footage is too, too much. These would actually be smaller. Um, I, would, I don't like the word tiny home, but they're small, and, and, they're, and they're beautiful. And so one of the things that would have to change whether it would be through the county or with the city's help is the square footage would be smaller for these kind of developments. Um, and I, I thought that that was a really important point to bring out to our communities, to something to, to look in the future that if you are looking to do some kind of workforce housing, um, that the square footage needs to be different than what we have on the books in a lot of our communities. Because I know the three of us, it, we didn't have the, the correct size that would be needed. So I, I did want to throw that out there so sure. that you would know that. Um, any, anyone want to make any comments, even in the audience, um, about opportunities? Commissioner Edgars? Yeah, just I, I was my previous comment, that didn't count. That was really uh, okay, following, that's okay. following up to okay. Commissioner Long's comment. The only thing I was going to just bring to the table, and I think we, we've talked about um, a lot of things, but I really believe that whether it's economic and jobs in, in, in one corner um, and whether it's training and education in another corner or the housing, 
I don't think we can talk about any of those items individually anymore. We have to talk about them collectively. Um, and, it, without, and, and, and we can't expect government to be the, the solution. And you can't expect the private sector to be the solution. And I think it's really, or the colleges and universities to be these. It is clearly an effort that we're all going to have to partake in. And, and, and if you don't think it's important uh, for economic development, getting new people coming here, companies and higher paying jobs, and you don't deal with housing, then you're going to have people leaving, or they're going to be working or living in Pasco and then finally getting a job there, and it's going to be more costly later to replace those folks. So, I, and, I, and again, I, it, there's no easy solution to any of this, but if we're not at the table with business sectors, uh, the school system, I know they've got lots of extra land. I know there's discussions about perhaps some housing. And another, the final comment I'd make is there has to be a terminology issue with affordable housing because it, you know, it brings out a lot of negative connotations. And I, somebody said the other day, attainable housing. Uh, somebody said uh, workforce housing. Somebody said, I don't know what it is, but you know, it, when you start talking about affordable housing, um, the NIMBY factor really starts to take hold a little bit. And so that really, they say, yeah, we need it, but not here. Because, and I, and I try to say, well, that's where our first responders and our teachers are working and some of our uh, manufacturing company employees are working. And, oh, but it's, it's, a, it's, it's affordable. How? I said, so there's, a, there's, a, there's that kind of perception issue going on. But it is critically important that we kind of keep working at that um, on all fronts. So that was my only comment. Thank you for letting Thank me. Thank you. Right. Anyone else? Mayor Grubachowski? And you look very pretty today, just saying. Are we talking about the subjects for group discussion, or is that coming next? You can talk about, yes, any of those. That's fine. Yes, that's okay. fine. Okay. So just listening to everybody, a couple of things I think, you know, we can continue to talk about, but the transportation system needs and priorities. Um, the system needs a funding source. We can't do anything until we get that. I mean, we have some small amounts of funding um, in different pockets. And I know we're working on our Advantage Pinellas update, and I know all of that. But until we get a funding source that actually allows us to get large scope projects done, we'll keep talking. I can tell you that that's my frustration. That's the city of Dunedin's frustration. They're tired of hearing, well, we're working on it, we're working on it, we're working on it. I'm sure that Janet, as long as you've been a part of it, you, you can sympathize. Um, it's extremely frustrating. And what it causes cities like mine is they start spending property tax money on transportation things, or let's say transit things that should be done through a trans transit funding mechanism. So it ends up costing our residents even more. Um, I can tell you, we, you know, we are one of many North County cities that have the Jolly Trolley, right? Um, the North Coastal Route. It's still a one hour service. Even though it took over a bus line for PSTA, and we were told 11 years ago, or in 2011, so 12 years ago almost, when we've started it, that eventually PSDA would take it over. But they can't, because they're capped at a 0.75 millage. And nobody can seem to convince anybody to raise that cap, so how are they going to spend any more money on transit? That, and we have five cities that are allowed to opt out of transportation funding, transit funding, in this county. We have serious funding issues. Um, and the last time that anything came before the voters was in 2000, 2014. It failed. And I think we all know the reasons why it failed. But until we can get a solid funding source for transit in Pinellas County, we can talk about all the reasons to have them, connecting jobs and housing and getting, you know, all of those things. But we, what we don't talk a lot about is our number one economic driver in the state, but especially in Pinellas County, is tourism. And when you look at the numbers, you just 
feel free to talk to visit St. Pete Clearwater. When you look at the numbers, we have 15 million people coming to this county every year. We only have a million people that live here. Something like 85 to 90% of those 15 million come either by car or rent a car. If we don't give them a way to get from the airport to us and get to the favorite tourism spots that there are, that in itself, I guarantee you, will relieve what our residents feel every day. But we don't talk about that. And that requires funding. It's a real problem. And I'll just throw another um, issue when we talk about you know, workforce and attainable housing. I mean, I agree with what everybody said, and Dunedin's trying to do it. But remember, Dunedin's only 38,000. So we're considered a small city, even though I think we're the fifth or sixth largest. So think about below us how many cities there are that are smaller than us, right? Well, it's not just Clearwater, St. Pete, Largo, Pinellas Park, you know, the larger communities that need this type of housing, right? But it ends up being those communities that have better bus service that get the funding. Because guess what? In order to get a lot of grant funding, you have to be on a 15-minute service line. I don't even have that anywhere in my city. So how am I supposed to get grant money? So some of that comes from the county problem, and some of it comes from a state problem. So we need to get the money that is available for grant money freed up, because just because I'm a tourist town doesn't mean I don't need attainable housing for the people that work there. And it, and it goes for the same for Indian Rocks Beach who may not have it because the property is expensive, but how could they ever provide it, or how can any of the smaller cities ever provide it if they don't have the same access to grant funding when transit is what gives you the major points in order to be able to give it done, get it done, and number of units. Who cares if you only have 30 units or 50 units? Why does it have to be 150? I don't have a city that can accommodate that, but I can maybe do 50 units or 75, but you get more points for that. So making the grants more feasible for smaller communities, given the fact that we uniquely in Florida have 24 communities, we, we need access to that funding as well. So those are two things I just would love the group to think about as they're moving along. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone in the audience? Mayor Dan, your city is moving along and you're doing all kinds of great things with mixed juice. Do you have anything that you want to add? Thank you, Kennedy. Chairman, I appreciate it very much. Hello, everyone. Sorry I was a little late. But anyways, yes, the city of Oldsmar is moving forward with several different projects. We just approved our theater district project, which is going to be next to our library, which will be... Uh, townhomes with a mixed use of rental retail space along St. Pete Drive and uh, State Street in our city of Oldsmar. We just approved five developers to move forward with our downtown area. As you travel down Tampa Road, you'll see a large parcel of land that's been owned by the city for numerous of years. And our CR, it's in our CRA district. And we are moving forward to build some kind of redevelopment in that area. And as far as affordable housing goes, that is something that uh, we do have in our city. But I'm also concerned about workforce housing because we have, uh, the Chamber of Commerce does this monthly We Mean Business where we travel to our local businesses. And one of the questions that I always ask the owner or the person that's giving us the tour of that business is where do your employees work? And they always say the same thing. They live in Palm Harbor, they live in Pasco County, or they live in town and country. Most of them don't live in Oldsmar. And that's a concern for me because we need more affordable housing or workforce housing in our city. So. With this redevelopment district that we're going to build next to our city hall, or if we remove our city hall, 
that's going to be something that we need to be able to house employees that work within the city of Oldsmar. We have some major, huge corporations that live in Oldsmar. Also, as far as transportation, the Sunrunner was a, as uh, Janet Long said, the, the Sunrunner project was a success for the PSTA. I really feel that that is moving forward. We need transportation to extend the US 19 all the way up to Tampa Road because we're having bottlenecks on Tampa Road, Curlew Road, all in the north segment going to Tampa or to Clearwater or even to uh, just going north on, on US 19. It's all always backed up. I try to avoid those areas and that's a real big concern for me is uh, the traffic that we're having on US 19. So as the mayor, Denny, and said, Julie said, we need more funding for transportation so that we can improve our transportation in not only Oldsmar, but the surrounding cities of Safety Harbor and stuff like that. Uh, I hope, I, as far as in, environmental resiliency and sustainability, I was in an all day conference yesterday with Mayor Allen from St. Pete Beach. Uh, that was a long day, but we learned a lot about other cities that are having high tide, flood issues. All of a sudden, this high tide is just all of a sudden invading their cities. It's foot, two foot of, of water around our country. And I'm concerned about the city of Oldsmar. You know, as they said at the luncheon on Friday, we didn't, we didn't dodge a bullet, the city of Oldsmar, we dodged a bomb and that hurricane. So I'm concerned about resiliency too and protecting our city and our residents to make sure that we're safe for the future in case there is another catastrophic storm. So with that, I, I, there's a lot going on in our city. Uh, as a new mayor, I'm, I'm, I learn something new every single day. It's, it's absolutely amazing, the stuff that's going on. But we're going to move forward, and we're going to continue to make it a better place to live for the people of the city of Oldsmar. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Burton, would you just like to come up and say a couple words as our wonderful county administrator? While he's coming up, I just I wanted to uh, bring up the, the beach renourishment and how we're obviously having a problem on the beaches with it, and it is, you know, I always say that uh, we did not get the easements, so it doesn't just affect all of us on the beaches, but it affects all the tourist trade, it affects everybody who works in the businesses, um, and I, I don't know what the answer is. I, I think I've been everywhere, written to everybody, up to the president. Um, all of the beach mayors have all lent a hand to help me. and. Um, I really, I don't know what to do. So I'm just throwing that out there to our county uh, commissioners and also our county administrator. And um, with that, your turn. Well, um, so I didn't know that I was gonna be speaking, so <laughs> what comes out of it. Um, so, you know, if there's something that galvanized everybody and brought every, all the beach communities together along with the county is the issue with beach nourishment. You know, and you and you saw the force. Unfortunately, we've been, we've been unable to get any relief on that particular issue. And I think between our county commission, our state rep and federal representatives, they've pushed that issue up, you know, as about as high as you can go through the Corps of Engineers. And so far, there's no relief. Right. So that means that we're going to face an issue with beach nourishment where we have property owners that own part of that section of beach. Um, and most recently, er, the, the one that's coming up is going to pass by us, and we're going to see that section of beach not be renourished. So it's going to miss that cycle that then puts it off for another five years, if we can hit that cycle, in, in, or, and something's got to change. So we do face a major challenge there. I think the issue you guys are talking about, though, and I'm, I'm happy to see everybody coming together, because it's not the county or a city or anybody else, it's us collectively that's going to have to solve these issues. And the issue of, of affordable housing is, I couldn't agree more that it's, a, a, it's an all-in issue. It's becoming more challenging, you know, and I've had co conversations with different uh, communities that are right here where we saw we were struggling to fund $35,000 a unit in affordable housing projects, and now we're seeing prices of over $70,000. But where's that money gonna come from, you know? 
and, and it can't always be adding more to it. So what does that mean? Do we, are we gonna increase densities? Okay, not a popular solution. I heard you know, some of the issue about a nut in our backyard. Well, you know, the Ford Pinellas plan addresses that. We have yet to realize the density issues and the bonuses that have um, we've been able to put into projects following the Ford Pinellas plan, the Advantage Pinellas plan. So, you know, that those types of issues we're going to have to look and address. And if we're going to achieve something, it's got to be a little bit of money. It's got to be a little bit of backbone. Um, but we're going to have to come together and um, make some tough choices, or you're not going to see the type of housing change that you're looking to accomplish. It, it won't occur. Um, there, and, and there's not enough money in the $80 million that the county commission set aside. And remember, we're only 12% of the funding that goes into affordable housing. It comes out of ship money. It comes out of 4%, 9% tax credits. It's a variety of funding sources. We're one small piece, and we would not be able to make up that difference. So how are we going to solve that? And it's going to have to be an all-in approach. I mean, Largo's done an amazing job you know, with some of their affordable housing projects and really getting that mixed use. A lot of the projects that have come to us have been all affordable housing projects um, and, and to where we're not getting the quite mixed use that we're seeing there and down in St. Petersburg. Um, so there there's really ha needs to be a variety, but, I, and so what I would encourage here is to join the compact. So we started the compact, some of the major players have been part of that. And that's where we're bringing all of our um, community development and housing folks together to try to come up with solutions that you can jump onto. But you're gonna to need to give them um, uh, the, uh, the encouragement to come up with some challenging solutions because they're not gonna be easy. The anti-stigma campaign should be for, first and foremost as part of that. How do we, how do, how do we message it when, when, you know, and it's easy for staff, we're sitting in the background and you're getting beat up in that meeting when you talk about density issues in neighborhoods that are changing. Um, well, who, who shows up in support of those projects to help you out? No one, you know, and that's part of the problem. And so we really need to come together with, through the housing compact to put these issues on the table and divide and conquer and come up with solutions that then you can take hold of and come together to solve. So I would encourage everyone, all 24 cities to join the compact. Some, uh, many of you are, um, but that is, I think, a regional solution to a very difficult issue that, and, and it creates an opportunity for us to really work together to solve that. So Thank with that. You very, thank you very perfect. much. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm gonna turn it over to Witt. Yeah, I'd just like to open it up uh, for anybody to talk now. We, we've had some guest speakers come in. You can either react to those comments, uh, but I would like to ask you all to think a little bit about what Ford Pinellas can do for your community what you would like to tell Ford Pinellas as an agency, as a board, we've got some new board members coming on. What do you want us to tackle this year? And how can we best serve your needs uh, in, in not only the county, but in the region as well? Uh, you know, as we kick off this long range plan, I wanna remind everybody that one of the things that's important about a long range transportation plan is that if you want state or federal funding on a project, you can't get it unless it's in that plan. We can always go back and amend the plan, but it's better to think of it and put it together holistically and in a complementary way with what you're doing at the local government level. And the other thing is that funding for transportation can tackle a lot of problems. Now, there's some limits on that. You know, we're not gonna relocate your utilities if that's, you know, 75% of the cost of the transportation project. But if you've got a stormwater problem, and we have a lot of stormwater problems, a lot of times building the transportation infrastructure, whether it's US-19 or something we might be doing on I-175 in St. Petersburg or I-275 through St. Petersburg in Mid-County, that can solve some stormwater and drainage problems. And so there's some complementary efforts there. Just like with transit, if you're, if you're putting in better, higher frequency transit, then that's a perfect spot for mixed use housing that, that appeals to different income ranges. So there's, there's a lot of killing two birds with one stone when it comes to transportation projects. But we don't often know what those needs are unless we're hearing from the communities. So a lot of your staff serve on our advisory committees, uh, but a lot of times the staff don't necessarily speak up and we don't know unless we ask them specifically. So this is a real good opportunity, I think, to maybe turn the discussion into, what do you want Ford Pinellas to do for you? And, and it's not just us, it's, but it's us kind of leading the collaboration, leading the dialogue and engaging 
with all the cities in advancing those interests. So I would just open it up for anybody. And if we haven't heard from you today, we're going to start calling on you. Anybody? Vice Mayor Beckman, anything? I'm just a little hesitant about sunshine laws and ask, you know, but. This is a publicly advertised meeting, okay. so we're good. Oh, well, good, very good. Um, <laughs> it's live too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think, um, you know, uh, certainly affordable housing and environmental resiliency and sustainability rises to the top for me. I would just make one little note. Our green print 2.0 wasn't listed in here, but just want to say we're super proud of Clearwater's green print 2.0. I, you know, I concur with um, the mayor of Dunedin and the need for uh, funding and advocating at every level, state level, federal level, to get more funding. But I would also, you know, think that what can Forward Pinellas do is, uh, you know, why don't we? And I'm not part of the Forward Pinellas board or anything, but. Why don't we show up at each other's meetings and say this is a good project? I'm an elected official. I live in your neighboring, I live in our, our community, our greater region, and I think you should pass this and, and try to fight that nimbyism with elected officials standing up and saying this is what we need. I think, you know, wasn't one of the, the data points was we need a thousand workforce housing units per year for 10 years in order to really make a dent? Well, we should all be showing up at each other's meetings and saying these are the facts, we need it here, I need it in my community, we need it in every single community. Um, so I mean, if you can help send out those kinds of notices, like there's gonna be this, I mean we all read the newspaper, but this, these are some relevant uh, talking points, and then please show up and help me, help us. Very good. In saying that the other day, um, Mayor Wills and, um, our uh, state senator, uh, Hooper, came to Indian Rocks Beach. We were talking about vacation rentals, both sides. And um, I can tell you, we had them come and sit on the dais with us, all the commissioners, and um, it's very comforting, and it, it makes you, you know, that you have another elected official with you that has your back, you know? And um, I think that is a great idea to come to the cities and help. Mayor Hooper? With talking about funding, I mean, we know that the local option gas tax still exists, which has always been a hot potato, uh, even when gas prices were low and everybody's dealing with inflation. And then obviously a referendum passed by the citizens, uh, and if ever the millage rate could be increased for PSTA, but what other funding sources right now are available that we are not availing ourselves of? I think the big ones are the ones you mentioned. Uh, the, the county does have the ability for a charter county uh, surtax for sales tax for infrastructure. Uh, that was the green light referendum in 2014. Right. We, were, we were close to putting that back on the ballot in 2020 and then March came and uh, we put that off and that discussion has not been revisited. Um, and it's up to a penny, so that could be a quarter of a cent, it could be a half a cent, it could be a full cent. I think you're right though that if the voters don't see us coordinating and aligning with Hillsboro on such an initiative, I think that was one of the issues with the green light referendum. And I didn't live here at the time, but I was watching it from Orlando. And if it doesn't have anything for me to get to the airport or get to Tampa or, or make that connection, then I think it fell flat for a lot of folks. And it was also all transit. And we know in this county that not everybody takes transit, Transit is a huge need, but we have a lot of other needs, and there's a big backlog on just maintaining the roads and the sidewalks that we have. So I think if we were to craft something that spoke to all those different needs, safety, maintenance, uh, road construction, pedestrian crossings, and transit, it would probably have more chance of success. I mean, we always joke that the federal government is like God. God helps those who help themselves. That's right. Um, Secretary, you know, recently CSX basically said the line was off, off the table. Do you believe that's the case? I mean, Pinellas County's segment of it is so underutilized and it is such low hanging fruit that goes from downtown St. Pete through Pinellas Park, Largo, 
Clearwater up through Safety Harbor and Oldsmar. It just seems logical whether it's BRT or it's light rail. I know they want to sell the whole segment, not just parcels, but is there any movement on that? So they, they did come speak to us at T-Barta and we had an individual meeting with them um, later and actually Congresswoman Castor came into that meeting. But what they told us was that um, they didn't f outright flat say no, but what they did say was they have certain conditions before they'll really want to talk to us. Some of them are legal, like liability, who, you know, what liability protections they want and so forth. But one of the big ones was you got to tell us what you want to do and how you're going to pay for it. In other words, they don't want to spend a whole lot of time and effort on running down things that don't really have any, any plan. Are we looking at light rail? Are we looking at BRT? Are we looking at commuter rail? What are we looking at? Do we want to share the tracks with them? They did say, though, that they're not interested in outright selling the tracks because their business model has shifted a lot more towards freight movement. Um, but I think what you'll find with CSX is that until you really have something to present to them to consider, they're, they're not going to give you a whole lot of audience. I mean, that's my opinion. Um, so I wouldn't say it's 100% off the table, but I say that they're, they're going to want to see a real plan before they decide to talk to us in earnest, including a funding plan. Thank you. In addition to CSX, uh, there's also the Brightline high-speed rail project that's under development that's already operating from Miami to uh, Palm Beach, West Palm. It's under construction from West Palm to Orlando, and it'll be open for service uh, between Orlando International Airport and uh, downtown Miami in September, October of 2023, less than a year from now. And the plan after that is to come to Tampa. And I know a few years ago there was some debate. Are they going to go to Jacksonville? Are they going to go to Tampa? Well, they've, they've planted their flag. They're going to Tampa. I believe they've worked out most of their uh, issues with FDOT on right-of-way and connections. Um, so they're looking at coming to Union um, Station in Tampa. So what's our plan for connecting to high-speed rail that comes to the Tampa Bay area from Pinellas? Because we know that the Brightline trains that they're using are not going to be able to go across the Howard Franklin Bridge, the new bridge, when it's built. It won't be able to withstand that, that level of, of, of weight of a locomotive. Um, and they won't be able to use the CSX tracks in the condition they are today. So we're going to have to figure out something to connect to Brightline if we want to see the full value in Pinellas County of that statewide, mostly privately funded uh, high-speed rail service. So I put that out there. That's something I think we as a region need to come together and figure out. And it's interesting, you know, we, we think of our, our, our region as the three counties, but I had a phone call from Manatee County not long after I took this job. Manatee County was my longtime uh, consultant client. And, and they called me up and they said, uh, you need to solve the rail problem in Tampa Bay because we know until you solve it, we'll never have anything in Manatee County, but we're looking at you and we want to be next. And I think Pasco County feels the same way. We're looking at you, we need to figure out what's next. So I think the pressure is on Pinellas and Hillsboro to figure out a way to come together as a region. And whether that's through a governance structure like Commissioner Long suggested or some other mechanism, We've got to overcome, in my opinion, the lack of trust that we have between elected officials, between staff um, of these different organizations, because we just don't, we just don't connect. And, and um, Councilmember Driscoll, I'll, I'll maybe pick on you a little bit. You went to that first meeting on Friday. It wasn't our most um, contentious and difficult meeting, but it certainly wasn't our easiest. And I feel bad I did that to you. <laughs> and I just would like to maybe get your perspective as incoming chair of PSTA, as St. Pete council chair now, um, and having come off that experience, what are your thoughts for how we need to work together on a vision for our Tampa Bay region? Thank you. Well, I, I guess the group was on their best behavior. <laughs> <laughs> for the for the new person, um, it was an interesting first meeting for me. Um, got to really see that we do have some allies in this effort to create more regional opportunities. And 
and and we see that there are some challenges too with getting everyone on board. So it was um, it was a very good first meeting for me, actually, um, to get a lay of the land and see who who we need to talk with, how we can partner with folks like uh, like Secretary Gwen to really make this happen. But I see there is. <coughs> I think we have a really good shot at pulling this together and having a regional effort. Um, it's just going to be a matter of showing showing Hillsboro and Tampa that they this is going to benefit them as well. What else would you like me to share? <laughs> okay. Yes. To that point. Councilwoman, the, it's not the city of Tampa. The city of Tampa, my understanding is, is way on board, especially in terms of working towards a regional MPO. The question I was asked is, okay, what's our next step? And therein, we kind of come to a, well, what is our next step? Because from the conversations that I've had personally, Pasco's on board, Pinellas could be on board, and Tampa's on board, and I think the city of St. Pete is, or so I understand, willing to talk about it. So, um, and the other thing, and oh, Whit, please correct my statement if I misspeak, because I think I'm correct, but there might be a piece of it I'm missing. My understanding is going forward with a regional MPO, we almost, and, and maybe Secretary Gwynn's not gonna like my comment, but the county, Hillsborough County, can kind of be squeezed to participate because it's really the two largest cities that have a veto power. Is that right, Whit? Did I get that right? Yeah, there's there's some vagueness in the statute, but that is, that is clear that you need the support of the largest city in the urbanized area or the largest city in the MPO area, and so that's why there's some vagueness. Um, the other thing is you need 75% of the population in the urbanized area to support it. And so it's hard not to include Hillsborough County in that dynamic because they have 900,000 or so, well, no more than that, they have about 1.5 million residents. So how do you get to 75% if you don't include Hillsborough County? Well, here's an idea. When I, this, I learned this when I was in the legislature. If you really want to solve a problem or find out where the problem is, follow the money. And so if there was a way, and it's a big if, but if there was a way for the legislature to incentivize or not for us to move forward, there you go. I think mm. we can make it happen. Mm. That's interesting. And I have been told by people who are kind of sort of in the know that um, the governor's office is very interested in this type of a plan. I don't know if that's true. Mm. Obviously, I wouldn't be the right person to be. I don't know how far those discussions are going, but that, there, but, there have been some discussions. Yeah. That's right. You know, okay. um, yeah. I, I guess I want to set some context for folks a little bit. This urbanized area gets roughly $50 million a year in flexible transportation funding that can go to almost anything, almost. Like I said, it can't re relocate your utilities. But that $50 million annually, if we were to set aside 20 million of that, 30 million of that, 10 million of that, for regional, a regional project of some sort. Maybe it's upgrading the CSX lines if, that, if an agreement can be made. Maybe it's doing something along the Gandhi Corridor, which is undergoing a, a PD&E study now. Um, over a period of five or six years, you'd have some real money to match with state or federal funds. And what's happening today is the Florida Department of Transportation takes that $50 million and allocates it before we ever see any of it to Pinellas, Pasco, and Hillsboro. So we get our $13 million or whatever it is, and we're pretty happy with that. And we've got a lot of projects that we wanna spread that around to the county. So we, we do, we, we use that on complete streets, we use it on 
Our active transportation plan, we use it, uh, some of that was used to build the Gateway Expressway, which is nearing completion. So we're putting on our highways, we're putting on transit. Hillsborough County gets a little bit more and they spend it on their projects. Pasco gets a little bit less and they spend it on their projects. But nobody is taking that $50 million in flexible funding and saying, here's how we want you to allocate that money and we're willing to put aside 2 million, 5 million, 10 million every year towards that project. We do have a list of regional priorities that we just adopted on Friday. Some of them are vague, some of them are very specific projects like the West Shore Interchange. But until you commit those dollars, it's really kind of a wish list. So that's the advantage of getting everybody in room and making decisions. Um, because right now we have these advisory groups that get together once every quarter and it just doesn't, in my view, breed the familiarity that you need to make serious policy changes in how you operate mm -hmm. as a region. Thank you. I, I agree. And while I still have the floor, I, I just want to clarify that um, the reason that I indicated that the, the city of Tampa might um, still have a ways to go is that the council member representing the city of Tampa um, voted against further exploration, exploration of this. So it was uh, council member Citro. So, um, I, Costa, would, is there anything I, that you, are, are you? I think that this, um, this conversation should be happening more than, more often than when those meetings are taking place. And so my, my suggestion would be that we have, um, that we continue to have our, our part of the conversation and continue to discuss what this could look like how we how we how we would allocate funding and keep doing that exploring at least on our own uh, while we wait for others to to get on board lead by example kind of what you're saying yes yes thank you thank you council member driscoll yes mayor all right i um thank you for coming down here this has been my uh, first experience with uh, ford pinellas and I'd be remiss if I didn't say anything on behalf of Tarpon Springs. Okay. Um, much of the discussion here is way above the altitude of Tarpon Springs. I mean, we're fairly self-sufficient. Our problems are north-south, US 19, alternate 19. We're very well off east-west, except for the barriers that these roads provide us. Um, the one thing as far as feedback, which I think is important for me to tell you specifically, um, Mr. Blanton, is the fact that our priority and what I feel that's the most important that's benefited us lately is the Complete Streets Program. And um, it allows us to rely on funding that doesn't come out of our budget, for example, and it, it solves a problem. It helps us make a decision. It keeps us from making a bad decision, and it, makes us, it helps us make a, a good decision. The, the latest one was um, uh, extending Belcher through Tarpon Springs all the way up to the Anclo River and, and many of the residents. The premise was that it would help the really reduce the commute on both US 19, alternate 19. And um, I was betting that that was not the case. Kimberly Horn thought that that might be okay. It turned out that um, I think by extending Belcher to uh, Anklo River, um, which would be our Oak, um, Live Oak Street, uh, I think we gained a 15 minute, 15 second commute on alternate 19 and five second on, on um, or vice versa on US 19, five second on alternate 19, which was in the noise. And so there wasn't that justification of extending Belcher for that reason, but we did identify some uh, benefits for circulation. And, um, and, and that's gonna happen at some point in time, but it's not high on our priority uh, in Tarpon Springs. But the Complete Streets program, on a, in terms of the larger programs that you've got in forward Pinellas, that program is very important to us, and, and we'll be utilizing that hopefully in the future again um, with some of the um, same kind of questions that we'll have uh, with regarding to um, uh, utilizing local facilities to help uh, relieve pressure on US 19 and, and um, alternate 19. 
The number one priority for us is safety. I mean, without a doubt, I don't hear too many complaints about getting to point A to point B. We're very self-sufficient Tarpon Springs. Um, the biggest discussion is if they, someone has to go down to uh, Dillard's or Macy's or something like that, it's not so much how long it's going to take. There's an expectation that it's going to take a while, and they'll basically pick the times that they're going to go. But it's, the, it's actually they're not accustomed to driving US-19. Most people stay in town. And so um, as far as commuting for work, there isn't a whole lot of discussion about that either. But it's, it's safety getting out there on any time and, and, and arriving to where you need to go and then returning. And then the other um, part that I think is very important for uh, Tarpon Springs, again, is not so much from the residents' view and, and traveling and um, north and south, but it's visitors. We're very much tourist-based, and our interest is how to get visitors to Tarpon Springs and back from Tarpon Springs to wherever they're from, Clearwater, Clearwater Beach. We, we get a lot of people that go to the beaches, but then they want a little bit of a different sort of flavor of their visit, so they'll come to Tarpon Springs. Um, as far as the population itself, we're very focused on multimodal transportation, pedestrian, bicycle, and, and we're seeing our, our low-speed vehicle community, I don't want to call them golf carts, but our low-speed vehicle community growing in Tarpon Springs. So again, our interest in terms of forward pinellas is not the, the uh, um, you know, the huge travel plans as far as four-laning, six-laning. Um, there is, uh, I know FDOT is well aware of the Anclote River Bridge, um, you know, and, and the bottleneck that that, that uh, has. Uh, and also, um, I think our problem as far as large-scale transportation, uh, we, we get Pasco's problems. So, I mean, and that's going to be FDOT's coordination is to deal with that for us. So I just want to share with you that the Complete Streets program is very important to us. I Thank appreciate you. that. Yes. Our, our yes. staff has been involved a little bit with the, um, with the, uh, the trail crossing issue that's yes, being that's right. addressed through, yeah. um, you know, that, that whole uh, issue with the Anclote River kind of washing out the foundation of where the trail is. It, it's, I get several calls about that, about when's it going to open up, and, and I, it's... Uh... It's going to be a while. <laughs> <laughs> right. But we're also now thinking about making a priority and talking with FDOT about maybe rerouting that trail to the Alt-19 corridor when you replace that bridge. Not right. you, but when we get we've, money to replace that bridge. We've just uh, approved the plans for connecting to yeah. Pasco's trail, and everybody's very, very happy about Excellent. that. So Very yeah. good. We only okay, have last a, call. Yeah, we only have a few more minutes, so if anybody has a Any burning issue you want to Any other comments anyone bring? wants to make that didn't speak? I'm going to go up to the podium here. While we're Mayor Dave. As you know, I live in uh, Bel Air Beach. Beach. And um, uh, we're very small, and we, uh, for the most part, have no businesses. Uh, we have a, a couple of timeshare condos and, uh, and one hotel that I believe is also a timeshare. Um, we are plagued with traffic. Right. We Gesture. are uh, completely overran with traffic that is uh, working its way to uh, Clearwater Beach. Uh, it's, it, in the mornings, it's, it's the staff. That's not a big issue, but whenever <coughs> the tourists come in, we are held hostage in our side streets off of Gulf Boulevard, and I have literally waited 10 minutes to, to get out. Uh, they're bumper to bumper. They, they will not give you a break. They won't put any distance between the cars. And um, I know that this isn't in the big picture for Pinellas County, but um, at the end of the day, you still have to address uh, the, the, the influx of humanity that would be getting off of these trains or riding these buses because the bus is not going to take them exactly to where they have to go. Um, and most people don't want to be inconvenienced with that. Uh, they would prefer to hop in their cars and happily drive to their hotel. Um, uh, there, has to be, uh, there has to be something uh, that can be done uh, for smaller communities that really don't benefit from tourism. Um, one of the ideas that, that we've been talking about for a while is creating a loop. 
uh, for the southern side of, of uh, Clearwater Beach so that they come in on the north side, they venture through the town, and then they go right back over to um, Gulf to Bay uh, with a new bridge. I know that that sounds uh, a little, uh, I don't know, it's uh, like a, a huge imagination, but um, these are things that, that our community uh, would like for you to seriously consider. Uh, but we're, we're suffering. And uh, I think that uh, I've seen that Bel Air Bluffs is suffering whenever you hit the end of West Bay and suddenly you're funneled into a single lane um, a Causeway Boulevard, funneled over onto a single lane of uh, Gulf Boulevard and all the way up to Clearwater Beach. Uh, if you come to my neighborhood at certain times of the year and certain weekends, it's, uh, it's, it's not worth it. Uh, so we, we choose to stay home or we go out, we venture out early in the morning, buy our groceries, um, get gas, uh, whatever, and then we go right back home and we wait for it to die, which is about seven or eight o'clock at night. So on the weekends, we are trapped. And um, just this is something that I would appreciate uh, very much if you would put this on your radar and, uh, and, and consider the small towns. Dave. Thank you. Very kind. Anyone else? I want to thank you all for coming. Um, I think I, I just want to let you know that uh, you know we do a citizen survey every three years. Number top three items. One is always traffic. So I think everybody feels your pain. Um, but I also want to remind you, as a small city, and I know you are. Um, that I'm assuming you get penny for Pinellas funding every year. That's a total benefit of tourism. And bed tax, which also helps support beach renourishment. And I think it's important that we all remember that m maybe I don't have the same attributes as Clearwater and maybe you as a small town don't have the same attributes as Dunedin. Whatever makes the county more successful and operate like a well-oiled machine benefits us all. And I, and I think we tend to go through that where some, and I'm not speaking about you, please, um, Mr. Gaddis. Um, I, I really, but you know, we've had issues over the years where certain small cities, we don't want it and we don't want the rest of the county to have it. And so I think just as we're talking about a regional MPO, I think we have to come together as the 24 cities to see the bigger picture, even if it may not affect our city per se. I think that's really important. Thank you. I think that's a good way to conclude because that's really what we're all about here. Um, I know Mayor Kennedy wanted to thank you all for being here. I want to thank you all for being here. This is a, a helpful discussion for us, and it's going to continue. Uh, starting in the spring, we're going to be doing a pretty extensive outreach um, and we're going to be talking to all the cities, we're going to be talking to the city managers around the county, we're going to be talking to others about this development of this uh, next long-range plan. And, and, you know, I said 2050 horizon. That's the horizon. We work with the Florida Department of Transportation in five-year increments to get projects funded. And so your, your idea, whether it's a bridge or whether it's a safety project or whether it's a trail project, typically that becomes a new project that we can fund in the next fifth year of the new DOT work program. And, and so it takes time, but pretty soon we're starting to see year after year after year, we're getting good projects on the ground starting to be built. The Harn Boulevard overpass is under construction today. Uh, I-275 is in design for you know, modernization, but we don't yet have construction funding. The Howard Franklin Bridge is, is going to be under construction. In a year, we're going to have the Gateway Expressway opened. There's a lot of good things that have been happening because we come together as this organization. So pay attention when we reach out to you and ask for time on your agenda because we'll be seeking your input on the development, not only of this plan, but how it relates to the other things we do, like redevelopment, affordable housing strategy, stormwater, all those other things that are complementary. I want to conclude 
by just recognizing our outgoing board members for just a minute. We only have two that we want to recognize here today. Council Member Bonnie Noble of Kenneth City is going to be leaving us uh, after this meeting, but we certainly welcome you back at any other meeting to share your ideas and thoughts from Kenneth City. Uh, come on up for just a moment, and we've got a small little award for you. So we know you're kind of an outdoors person, so we got you this backpack that you can use for whatever you want to do. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for being here. Did you get it? Okay, very good. All right, thank well, thank you. you so much. And then next, I want to invite Mayor Kennedy up here. Um, again, I can't believe it's been 10 years. Uh, you were on the board when I was hired, and uh, you've just been a joy to work with all those uh, years. And uh, the last year as chair has been a lot of fun. So you've brought some energy and everything, and so I just want to show our appreciation. Got something for you. This is what 10 years gets you. <laughs> David Jolly was then and Senator Nelson and um, we went in there fighting the fight and and we came back with some good things that time and Greg was with us and we had a great time but it, it, it is uh, one of the things that it, I have felt on this board Still is that up. regardless of what our personal ideologies might be is that we have always worked together and my father as you know taught government for 30 years and that was always his motto that once you're sitting in the chair, we have to be here together and we, and we have to find what's the best for everyone, whether it is a small city like David who does have a congestion problem or whether we have safety issues. You know, we all have safety issues or the problems we have on Golf Boulevard or in Dunedin or in St. Pete. And um, I, I always try to remember that, that, to try to think of us as a whole, even though I always, my first is for Indian Rock, Steve. So thank you. It's been a joy. And um, there's always new people to come on with new ideas. And so I'm going to look forward to seeing all of those. And I'm taking my <laughs> I'm leaving. So thank, thank you. Thank you. All right. all right. So thank you all for being here today. And please don't hesitate to reach out if there's anything you'd like to talk about. Congratulations again. Thank you. I appreciate that, Mayor. <laughs>